Uh, as I said, we're streaming live on YouTube and Facebook. You will have seen, if you're watching tonight, and many of you are, we're delighted about that, incidentally, that the two of us has become the three of us. Because here in studio, we are joined by a financial fair play expert and former financial advisor to Manchester City. He joined Simon and myself on TalkSport the other day and made headline news. And he is Stefan Borson. Stefan, good evening to you. Evening. Those three little initials, FFP, it's killed the window, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a, obviously it's a massive impact. You know, teams have got to look at uh, things differently after Everton. So it's the combination, I think, of the FFP rules that people were concerned about, but the game changer, of course, a 10-point deduction for Everton, which means that uh, for a long time people have talked about the rules not having teeth. Well, 10 points is, is teeth. And, do, do, uh, do you think that 10-point deduction there and then, Stefan, put fear into the other yeah. boardrooms all around the country. Yeah, I mean, everywhere. I think uh, anyone that was close to the limit uh, or were, were assuming that they would sell players between uh, uh, when the Everton decision happened in October and the end of the season, it, it's just shaken people. So they're now... The, the, the calculus of being able to ship out a player for 10, 20, 30 million quid has changed. You don't have that certainty. And if you haven't got the certainty that you can sell players uh, and make the profits that you need to make the, uh, the limits, you can't buy. So we have a paralysis in the market, uh, which is why you know, we've seen obviously almost no deals. But even the loan deals, people have been reluctant to spend the money. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, people have been haggling over even relatively small amounts of money on... On, on loan fees. But Stefan, you couldn't have expected this. Last January, 843 million. Tonight, 76. Yeah. Well, look, Chelsea distorted the market slightly last season, right? We all know that. Uh, their spending was, was unusual, shall we say, putting it politely. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's no other way. When you have the combination of the 10 points, plus what happens when we look at this three-year period that's going to be assessed next December, the year that's dropping out was a COVID year. And what that means is loads of teams had allowances, extra allowances for COVID. It meant that it was a year that most people from a FFP perspective actually had some of their best performance over the last five years. But when that drops out, when we do the assessment in December of this year, things are going to change. Yeah. Uh, you know, so people are going to be much closer to the limits. So you have a combination of teams who have chosen not to spend. So that's people like Arsenal. Because Arsenal could spend if they want to. Or not. If they were to invest the necessary equity, they could push their limit up to 105 million from the 15 that it is now. But they've opted to sort of stay out of the market. If they'd wanted to spend, Stefan, tonight, how much could they have spent, Arsenal? Well, it's, it's always very, very hard to roughly, calculate the exact roughly. amount. Oh, certainly, you know, tens of millions of pounds on, on, on a player. They could have bought the striker that... Everybody thinks they need. The, the, exactly. They could have got a striker and been nowhere near danger. If they'd have chosen to, it would have required the owners to have put in very considerable amounts of equity. So they would have had to put their hands in their pockets. And ultimately, I, you know, I, I think in line with most of the game around Europe, there is a limit and people are saying, actually, I don't want to do it anymore. Is this temporary or is it the new norm? Should Alex and I get used to this? We'll, we'll have to see. I mean, it's going to be very much depend on the, the rules that they bring in. So we know that there's a, a Premier League meeting coming up in the next couple of days uh, where they will uh, start to formulate a new set of rules. It is, as I understand it, likely that it will not affect the current season and that those rules will come in for next season and the seasons after. But the problem with all of the FFP rule sets is they're trying to make one, one uh, size fits all. But there's so many different interests in the Premier League. You have the American-led teams, the sort of private equity mindset. You have City, Newcastle, possibly looking with a, with a slightly different view of things. And then you have the smaller clubs, as, as Richard Masters called them <laughs> uh, in, the, yes. in, in Parliament. Yeah. And they have a different set of requirements as well. So... Trying to formulate one set of rules whilst also, and we have to be mindful of this, whilst also making sure that the teams that have breached historically and maybe are on the edge now also don't get away with it. So teams are going to be saying, hang on a minute, we're not changing the rules just as Chelsea are in trouble. Mm. We want to make sure 
that the rules still apply yep. to the extent that people get punished for the previous rules. What about the figure, um, Stefan? Because it's £105 million pounds you're allowed to lose over three years. A senior executive at a Premier League club said to me recently, that doesn't really work. When you look at when that benchmark was set, the game's different now. You've got, yeah. you've got inflation, the economic picture in the world has changed, let alone in the football world. You've got richer owners coming into football. You've got players earning more money. Does the threshold need to be increased from £105 million pounds over three years? Well, uh, look, it hasn't moved for years, right? So, so it hasn't moved with inflation and with, well, with no, the, the, the correct. changing economic situation? And if situation. you were to look at it, it uh, with inflation, it maybe would be £200 million, pounds, or you know, somewhere in that order, maybe maybe 170 But it, it, people misunderstand the 105. The 105 is after numerous allowances have already been made. So, you know, teams have made very, very substantial losses and then on top of that, I've been allowed certain addbacks for things like good expenditure, such as the stadium, the women's team, uh, other depreciation charges, mm. all, all sorts of uh, additional things that are added back. So, so the losses to breach 105 are actually very, very significant. You mentioned the stadium there. And obviously, Everton's argument, the basis of their appeal, as I understand it, is the fact that interest payments yeah. on loans taken out to build what looks a fantastic facility at Bramley Moor Dock they didn't think they would count as overspend. Do they have a leg to stand on? Is that going to hold up? I don't think it will. No, no. And, and, and look, even Everton didn't argue these things, right? By the end of the independent commission, they were about £2 million apart in terms of the level of breach. All of the independent commission effectively established at the end was that they breached by £20 million rather than ten. But really, Everton had sort of admitted the, the, the difference aside from £2.2 million which is what it was in the end. There was then an argument, really, only about aggravating factors and mitigation. They even agreed. Everton, and this is one thing that hasn't come across uh, at all, and maybe because it's the way Everton are briefing it, I don't know, but, but Everton fans have been somewhat misled. At the end of the day, Everton and, uh, and the Premier League, both at the Independent uh, Commission, accepted the principles of sanction. Those parameters by which the club would be sanctioned. So that there needed to be a punishment, that it was a serious offence, uh, that it was a sporting sanction and not merely a financial sanction. Then the only thing that was then outstanding was, OK, what aggravated the, 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 the breach? Uh, and in, in, in Everton's case, uh, the Independent Commission found that they misled the Premier League on, on certain aspects. Um, and the level of mitigation, ultimately, was, was pretty slim because... The arguments that were raised by Everton there were pretty weak. So uh, we're going to know the result of the appeal. We'll know fairly soon, I think, mid-February. Second guess it for us, Stefan. They may give them a token couple of points off for, for, for you know, them to try and give them something. But, but the reality is that uh, the arguments that they're able to run, remember, they're not going to review the facts again. The facts are settled. Mm. The Independent Commission mm. has decided what happened. They've decided there was a breach. So really the appeal is likely to be only about whether due weight was given to the aggravating factors and the mitigating factors and whether something was missed. So if you looked at, for example, the Sheffield Wednesday situation that many people look at to say Everton's fine uh, sanction will be reduced in half, in that situation it was different because what happened was that they missed a key factor, according to the appeal, which was the sale of the stadium. Everton don't appear to have that kind of argument here. Yeah. And in the absence of that kind of argument, it's hard to see how a, a, a materially different outcome uh, is achieved by them on appeal. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.